Our Heavenly Father, I just want to say thank you for the Sabbath blessings that uh, you have given unto us. And I want to pray that uh, the Spirit will guide us and uh, be able to lead us into all paths of righteousness. That as we study, Lord, it will not be in vain that we gather, but uh, it will be for the benefit of my own soul and uh, our brethren and sisters, wherever they are, that uh, we may be one family, uh, speaking one voice and uh, Lord, preparing each one of us and helping each other to be able to walk in the path of righteousness. And so I pray that the words that I'll speak may resonate with the minds here, that Father, we may get benefited in this discourse. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And so uh, I really like to appreciate the Lord and uh, what he's doing for us. And uh, yesterday we we started looking at this issue of uh, the return of uh, the midnight cry, the return of the midnight cry. And uh, for those who were not here, maybe you shall be able to be provided with uh, a link to the message of yesterday so that uh, we may be able to catch up with the uh, information that we had yesterday as we build upon that this is a three-part presentation we started yesterday and uh, this is the second presentation god willing tomorrow or uh, the sunday evening we can be able to have the last presentation now uh we are talking about the return of uh, the midnight cry and uh, our main book was um, uh, the book of uh, matthew chapter 25 the book of Matthew chapter 25. And uh, we looked at uh, some of the things which are so much interesting in, in this book of uh, Matthew chapter 25. Just for a recap, we saw that uh, the, the, the midnight cry was sounded back in 1840s to 18, uh, 1830s to 1843 under the feast of the trumpet and under the sounding of the first angel's message. And the midnight cry was to announce the judgment hour. And we know that that, that judgment that was sounded by the midnight cry of that time when was uh, about the judgment of uh, the dead, starting from Abel onward. But we saw yesterday that the return of the midnight cry will not signal the beginning of the judgment, but the end of the judgment. And per se, from early writing 254, we were able to identify, and from COL 402, 408, and 412, that it is um, uh, during uh, the time of uh, the judgment of the living. Also, what we realized is that uh, the Foolish virgins in the midnight cry of the end time are represented as uh, Laodiceans, and they are represented of uh, the ground that uh, was stony in the parable of uh, the, uh, the soul. And so another issue that uh, we addressed uh, during the Sabbath welcoming is that um, the midnight cry, when it returns, Seventh-day Adventists are tested with the image of the beast and not the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast is when the number is already made up. It is when the number is already made up uh, of those who are pure, sanctified, and uh, are ordained for the latter rain to be able to sound the loud cry. And that is the place that uh, we really we left at uh, just by touching and scratching the ground so that we may lay the foundation. But I want to enter into the second part of this message, the return of uh, uh, the latter rain and uh, the, the return of the midnight cry. And uh, when the midnight cry returns, it will be the, ju the, 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 the sounding of uh, the judgment of the living because uh, I just want to start on a high point where we saw in um, where we saw in uh, COL, and uh, I'll be able to put it on the screen. 
this is um, COL 412, COL 412. We are told this, it is in a crisis that character is revealed when the earnest voice proclaimed at midnight, behold the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him, and the sleeping virgins were aroused from their slumbers, it was seen who had made preparation for the event. Both parties were taken unawares, but one was prepared for the emergency and the other was found without uh, preparation. So uh, there is an event that is coming and people have to make preparation prior to that event. And then we are told this event is sudden and unlooked for calamity. Something that brings the soul. Something that brings the soul face to face with death. And so we are talking about an event. We are talking about it is sudden and unlooked for calamity. And we are talking about an event that brings the soul face to face with death will show whether there is any real faith in the promises of God. It will show whether the soul is sustained by grace. And then she connects that the great final test comes at the close of the human probation when it is too late for the soul need for the soul's need to be supplied. And so this is the very point that we should be looking at that the return of the midnight cry when it sounds it brings us to just the judgment of the living and not only that it arouses the sleeping virgins and the foolish ones go out to check for the oil and then when they come back the or the, um, the door is closed and from uh, uh testimonies to the church volume 9 page uh, 97 paragraph 2 we are told that uh, 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 the door is closed for those who will not enter while the mercy door is still open to those who did not have the truth of the time so it is too late for the foolish virgins who we are told they are also the Laodicean uh, people, and also we are told that uh, they are the hearts of stony ground. And it brings us, that event brings us to the final atonement, which we saw in Leviticus chapter 16 clearly, that uh, the atonement, when it began in 1844, it began with those who appeared before the Lord in the most holy place. And we understand that those are Seventh day Adventists. At the sounding of the midnight cry, actually, the Lord is standing at the ark. He's not seated anymore. We understand in 1844, he went and sat before the Father, and the books were open. But when the midnight cry returns, actually, he is standing at the ark. James chapter 5 says that he is coming out of the door. Leviticus chapter 16 says that uh, he leaves the most holy place and does the atonement of the holy place. I, I can just uh, bring this on the screen so that uh, uh, we may catch up with it. If there are children there, they may be able to be benefited with what uh, we are saying. Leviticus chapter 16. Leviticus chapter 16. And uh, let me see. Verses um, 15 and 16 that uh, at this event of the midnight cry when it returns, we are told that uh, then shall he kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people and bring his blood within the veil and do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it upon the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. This is the beginning of the atonement when Christ goes inside and you understand that he is doing an atonement for the people who have entered the most holy place by faith. But at the end of the atonement, he shall make an atonement. This is the first atonement, but the second atonement he makes for the holy place. This is not for the people who entered into the most holy place by faith in 1844. The atonement in the holy place is not for the seventh day Adventists. This is how I understand things in the book of Leviticus. And then after leaving the holy place, he shall make an atonement for the tabernacle of the congregation. And then he will come out. And so the atonement in the holy place and the atonement in the courtyard is not for the Seventh-day Adventists. It is not the beginning of atonement 
but it is the end of the atonement. This atonement is what we are talking about. Uh, it is in early writing, 254 paragraph one, where we are told that uh, this is, he is making his final intercession. This is not the beginning. For all those whom must still lingers, and for those who have ignorantly broken the law of God, and we understand that it is not Seventh day Adventists who are breaking the law of God ignorantly. This atonement is made for the righteous dead as well as for the righteous living. Who are these righteous dead and who are these righteous living? So we understand it's the judgment of the living and the dead, but which group? It includes all who died trusting in Christ, but who not having received the light upon God's commandment. So if it is about the righteous dead, uh, who died without receiving light on God's commandment, it cannot be Abel at this point because Abel died knowing the commandments of the Lord. And in the beginning of the atonement in 1840s, he is the one that the Lord started with. For the judgment starts with the dead and then passes to the living. The first person to be judged is the first person who died and it is Abel. And so we cannot say that this righteous dead is Abel because he died knowing God's commandment. So it must be a certain other group and then the righteous living. This cannot be the judgment of Seventh-day Adventists because they are not singing without knowing the, God, the Lord's commandments. They had sinned ignorantly in transgressing his precepts. So this righteous dead and the righteous living are they that had sinned ignorantly in transgressing his precepts. But today, uh, I promised in this session, I'll try to go a little bit further in Revelation chapter 18. After looking at Revelation chapter 14, that is Matthew chapter 25, the return of the midnight cry, which is uh, the uh, coincided with the feast of the trumpets, and then the first angel's message, then the judgment of the dead, we transit to the return of the midnight cry, which actually it is the first angel's message, the second angel's message, and the third angel's message morphing into the loud cry. It starts at a midnight cry, behold, the bridegroom cometh, but then along the way, when the Sunday law is enacted, it morphs to the loud cry. Now, what, is, what I promised is to deal with these first verses of uh, Revelation chapter 18. And please, if uh, I'm so fast, just feel free to tell me to slow down. I'll try to do that. Try and remind me to go slow because there's no reason of going so uh, fast and then we miss the point. In the- yes, yes, please slow down a bit. Thank you, Elder Titus. And so in Revelation chapter 18, we understand it is um, the morphing of the first, the second, and the third angel's message. And when they come together, they uh, bring what we call the loud cry. But this is the transition from the midnight cry, which sounds the judgment not of 1840s of the dead and those who entered the most holy place by faith, but it is the judgment of the living the people who are living in the times of the Sunday law. Now, this midnight cry that moves to the loud cry, it is only sounded by the people whom God have ordained and are given the latter rain to empower the message so that the glory of the Lord may fill the, holy, the whole earth. That one you will find in Last Day Events, page 179, paragraph 2. I can just um, switch my screen to that, uh, LDE 179.2. Look at this. The great issue so near at hand, enforcement of Sunday laws will weed out those whom God has not ordained, and he will have a pure, true sanctified ministry prepared for the latter rain. So, before the Sunday laws are enacted, we have a, a ministry already appointed of God, pure, true, and sanctified. And this ministry is what receives the latter rain, which is Revelation chapter 18, verses 1. 
Now, those who will have not prepared at the enforcement of the Sunday law, they will be weeded out. Now, we understand those who are weeded out, they are the ones in Laodicean state. And we are told that the state of Laodicea is the same state represented of the foolish virgins. Where do you get that? That um, the foolish virgins, their state, sorry, the foolish virgin state, virgins, uh, Laodicea. That is uh, Review and Herald, Review and Herald, August 19, 1890, paragraph 10. We read, the state of the church represented by the foolish virgins is also spoken of as the Laodicean state. Now, go back to your Bible. Revelation chapter 18, it is only those who have been ordained, they are pure, true, and sanctified that sounds the uh, loud cry. This is the group that comes from the group of the midnight cry. They are the people who had prepared beforehand. This is the place where the Laodiceans and the foolish virgins are lost. But hold on a minute. And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. There is mistakes that we have taken or we have espoused as Seventh-day Adventists. I say it's a mistake, and you will allow me to uh, expound on that. This has been a notion that uh, people are sounding Revelation chapter 18 or what we call the fourth angel's message. But I, I want us to be sure if you are sounding the third angel's message uh, or this fourth angel's message or the loud cry has begun and such a, like things you hear that the loud cry has begun and all this stuff. We are told the earth was lightened with his glory. The question we have to ask ourselves, what kind of glory is this and what lightens the earth with the glory. We are told in uh, uh, in Isaiah chapter 58, allow me to go there, Isaiah chapter 58, and I want you to see how it this loud cry comes and then the light fills the whole earth. In uh, Isaiah chapter 58, it is um, talking about the third angel's message in verity. You can read that in Sister White's writing, many quotations that Isaiah 58 is for Seventh-day Adventist, and it is the third angel's message in verity. This is the right arm of the gospel. But after telling you what you have to do, then we are told that uh, after doing all these things that are written as the right arm of the third angel's message, verse 8, then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thine health shall spring forth speedily, and thy righteousness shall go before thee, the glory of the Lord shall be thy rare reward. And so if People will say that they are sounding Revelation chapter 18. They cannot claim to sound Revelation chapter 18 without doing the things which are listed in Isaiah 58, which is the third angel's message for the Seventh-day Adventists. And I can just read one quote to confirm that to us about Isaiah 58. Isaiah 58. Oh. Uh, I, I, I'll write uh, just a moment. Now, in uh, Christian service, we are told, I cannot too strongly urge all our church members, all who are true missionaries, all who believe what? The third angel's message 
all who turn away their feet from the Sabbath to consider the message of the 58th chapter of Isaiah. The work of the beneficence enjoined in this chapter is the work that God requires his people to do at this time. It is a work of his own appointment. We are not left in doubt as to where the message applies and the time, listen to this, and the time of it is marked fulfillment, we read, they that shall be of thee shall build the always places, thou shalt raise up the foundation of many generations, and thou shalt be called the repairers of the bridge, the restorer of the past uh, to dwell in. And so the marked time of the fulfillment of this message is during the third angel's message. Now, that is much interesting to think about that. And then that is when we are told, after doing these things, then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thine health shall spring forth speedily, and thy righteousness shall go before thee, the glory of the Lord shall be thy reward. Now, the book of Matthew, chapter 25, again. Look at the wise virgin. They that were wise, what did they do? But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamb. And so at the time of uh, the announcement of um, the angel of Revelation chapter 18, it is that oil that they had carried extra that burns and bring about the glory, the light, so that uh, the bridegroom may be able to do the work for uh, such a time as this. And we saw in uh, 1 MR, I continue repeating it, 1 MR 228.1, uh, point two, God's purpose in giving the third angel's message to the world is to prepare people to stand true to him during investigative judgment. This is the purpose for which we establish and maintain our publishing houses, our schools, our sanitarium, hygienic restaurant, treatment rooms, and food factories. So for the wise virgin to be able to do the work of Isaiah 58, then their light breaks forth as the morning and their righteousness go as a re rare word they must have these institutions that are to make them stand during the investigative judgment of the third angel's message. Without this, it is impossible for you to go to Revelation chapter 2, saying Babylon is fallen, is fallen. You will be a foolish virgin to say Babylon is fallen, is fallen, and then if somebody asks you to prove how Babylon is fallen, there is nothing to show that is working on your side that makes Babylon to fall. There is nothing you can show that is working on your side that will make Babylon look really that it has fallen. And this is the mistake that I'm saying we have been doing. We say that we are proclaiming the third angel's message in very Sorry, we, we say that uh, we are proclaiming the third angel's message in verity. We say that we are proclaiming the loud cry, but again, there are no institutions that shows the glory of God. The right arm of the third angel's message in Isaiah chapter 58, it's not working. And so we cannot say, Isaiah 58, once again. We cannot say that uh, our light is going forth as uh, a rare word. Look here. Then shall, thy, that, then shall thou call, and the Lord shall answer thou, uh, shall cry, and he shall say, here I am. If thou take away from the ministry of thee the yoke, the putting forth of the finger, and the speaking of vanity, then um, we are told in uh, 
verse 8, then shall thy light break forth as the morning and thine health shall spring forth speedily and thy righteousness shall go before thee. Now we understand that uh, the third angel's message is righteousness by faith in verity. And we are being told that once we do the things listed above, the glory of the Lord shall fill the earth and then our righteousness shall go before us as um, a re reward. It will be righteousness by faith. If we are not building these institutions, and I'm just about to bring something on the screen that uh, will really resonate with what I'm saying. Revelation chapter 18 again. Revelation chapter 18, sorry. Revelation chapter 18. Now, the glory has to go first before the proclamation that Babylon is fallen. But what we are doing and what we have been doing since 1890s is pronouncing Babylon is fallen when the glory is not there. This is doing things oppositely of what God has really told us to do. We have to do something of Isaiah chapter 58, then the light breaks forth as morning, then the righteousness follows, then we can be able to say, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. You know, you cannot pronounce a certain system fallen when that system is the one still sustaining you. It is impossible. And so when I hear somebody saying that uh, I'm uh, sounding the message of Revelation chapter 18, the first thing I ask myself, where is the application of Isaiah chapter 58 before you tell me of Revelation chapter 18? So there is the earth being lightened with the glory, which means that our systems are working better than the systems of Babylon. Then we can pronounce Babylon fallen. After pronouncing Babylon fallen, which is the second angel's message, then we can go to verse four and say, come out of her, my people. That is the chronology of Revelation chapter 18, but we start at, uh, verse 2 and then leap to verse 4 and then try to come back at verse 1. Such a kind of working brothers and sisters will never accomplish the work. If God says that this is the blueprint of the work, you cannot better on on the plan of God and his blueprint. We are trying to come up with a blueprint that is not in Revelation chapter 18 and that is why we are failing. If really we were doing the right thing, then we will not be here even today as I'm speaking. The Lord will have come and taken his own. But because we have thought that we can improve on the blueprint that the Lord has given unto us, that is why we are still here today. It will only need a people who understand the blueprint to be able to sound the loud cry. And they cannot sound the loud cry without Isaiah 58. Isaiah 58 is what goes before us before we proclaim. And so Revelation chapter 8, 18 is divided into two parts. First of all, there is the revelation of the message, and then there is the proclamation of the message. That is something that you don't hear people talk um, uh, uh, much about, that Revelation chapter 18 has two sections. That is, first of all, is the revelation of the message, which uh, actually is outlined better in uh, Matthew chapter 24, verse 14. The gospel of this kingdom shall go as a witness. Now, a witness, as you understand, that is the jury that uh, gives evidence of the things they experienced, not the things they have had. We want to proclaim the message of the things we have had. But the Lord says this message has to go as a witness, the things that you have experienced yourself. So, if we will be able to sound the loud cry, we must understand the blueprint that first it is the revelation of the message. And the revelation is this, to have the facilities that reveals the system of God that works. Then we can go and proclaim the message. The systems have to go before us. They have to proclaim the message themselves before the mouth proclaim the message. And uh, I find that this is what we have been missing. But uh, I think in Adventism, we had one person who understood this thing well. And now I want just to take you back to our history. 
because when I look at myself and I look at the church, I look at the movement, I feel that uh, we are still wanting, we are still far from the ideal. And uh, I'm sorry to say that we are bound really to end up in the category of the foolish virgins. This is not to judge hearts, but you can look at things and weigh them. And just when you are studying things, you understand that, no, here I'm on the wrong path. This is not the right path. And so I'm looking at how God works with his blueprint. He gave the sanctuary and said that build it according to the pattern. But you find that people do it not according to the pattern, and they still want to be saved. And this is what we are attempting with the three angels' message. We like so much to proclaim it and denounce and denounce and denounce. But uh, when we are um, uh, really challenged to show the revelation of the message itself, not the proclamation of it, we have found that we are wanting in the balances of the sanctuary. But as I was saying, there is someone in Adventism who understood really the issues in Revelation chapter 18. And you will never guess the person. It is Dr. Kelo. And so I want us to go through the history in these few minutes so that we may understand really what is at the stake. And so allow me to go through this history. Be attentive, take the quotations, challenge your theology, challenge anyone who believes in these things and uh, who thinks that uh, we can be able to sound the loud cry without these things. This is the beginning of the loud cry. And uh, this is a history. This is our history, and we do not need to be ashamed of it. In the General Conference Bulletin, April 6, 1903, we are told October 10, November 5, in 1888, there was a ministerial institute and a general conference session held at Minneapolis. Now, the ministerial institute was the first where the delegates met to discuss doctrinal issues before the real presentations of uh, the general conference session. But uh, later on, there appeared a quotation from E.G. White that said, after the meeting at Minneapolis, Dr. Kellogg was a converted man, and we all knew it. We could see the converting power of God working in his heart and life. Now, pause a minute. Kellogg had been with Seventh-day Adventist since 1880s. He was raised up by James White and Ellen White after the parents died, and the mother committed Kellogg in the hands of the White's family. And she told them, please raise up my child. And Kellogg, Kellogg's family had succumbed uh, to death from diseases. And so he was much interested in the work of medical missionary. And so he went, the whites took him to a college and he studied medical missionary work. And then he came back to the denomination and started to do a work. But all this time from 1880s onward, we are told it is only after the Minneapolis meeting that Sister White says Kellogg was a converted man. But why does she say that Kellogg was a converted man? And remember, we are in Revelation chapter 18 and trying to understand what it's at stake. We are told that um, uh, uh, after that meeting of 1888, after Kellogg hearing, Alondo Trevor Jones says that the loud cry had begun. In that session, he challenged Alondo Trevor Jones on what he was preaching. Now, before you throw stones, we understand that E.G. White supported uh, E.J. Wagoner and Alondo Trevor Jones on the, uh, on, the, on the message of righteousness by faith. But when it came to what we call Revelation chapter 18, it was a whole matter, and you have to study the history of it. Uh, uh, I think that people will get into the pain of understanding Revelation chapter 18 in context of uh, 1888. So <clears throat> when Sister White said that uh, Kellogg had been converted, there is something that Kellogg was doing. This is what Kellogg says. I have given a quite good deal of thought and study to this subject. My wife 
and I have given considerable attention to this work for a number of years. Now, which work is he talking about? I'll just remind you, he's talking about the work of Isaiah 58, and soon we shall see it. We have been planning to raise 40 or 50 children ourselves. Just as fast as we get any money, we will invest it in children. I have done that for several years. Every single dollar that can be saved from other necessary expenses goes into the education of the children. He continues to say, I do not believe we have any right to accumulate money. I think as long as we are well and have God's blessing upon our work, it is our duty to spend what we earn in God's work. I do not believe that in this age, any man has a right to accumulate money. This is immediately after the 1888 session. Alonzo Trevor Jones is saying that the loud cry has begun, but then Kellogg is challenging him about his understanding of the loud cry of Revelation chapter 18. Continued on. They went and were able to start the Haskell home where they raised up the orphans and they started doing the work of Isaiah chapter 58. I'll pass over some things. And then um, look at this. January 27, March 7, 1893, Ministerial Institute and General Conference session held at Battle Creek. Elder A.T. Jones presents a 24-part series of the studies on the third angel's message, which goes from start to finish of the session. Dr. Kellogg presents a series of eight talks on medical missionary work between February 5 and 15. Here, the, the, the conference is developing into something that the people are so much interested to hear. What does the Lord have to speak to the church? And so, uh, I'll go a little bit forward, a little bit forward. When Kellogg came to the stage to present, he went ahead and quoted First Timothy chapter 6, verses 17 to 19, which says, Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good that they may be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. Now, let me remind you something about the foolish virgins. The foolish virgins had money. What they did, they kept it in the pocket. They did not buy extra oil, but the wise bought an extra oil to be able to sustain them in the time of need. This is what we are doing. The right arm of the third angel's message is the buying of that extra oil so that at the time of need, we may have the supply. But some people are becoming foolish virgins to keep holding wealth and keeping them back. And we are told in James chapter five, they are keeping it for the last days when at that time, when we need the facilities, they'll find that they don't have the facilities when they go to erect the facilities, they come back when the door has closed. And so Kellogg is up to something in this conference. And he continues to say that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Second Timothy 3.17. These are the quotations, the scriptures that he's having and presenting the third angels in line with Isaiah 58. And Trevor Alondo Jones is presenting the third angels message in another line. Those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. He continues to say, this is Kellogg, and let our people also learn to maintain good works to meet urgent needs that they may not be unfruitful. Titus 3, 14. Titus 2, 14, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify himself, his own special people, zealous for good works. Remember, Sister White is saying, Kellogg is a converted man when he is doing this. He goes ahead to say in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, Paul exhorts us, be followers of me, even as I also am of Christ, who Peter tells us left as an example that you should follow his steps. In Acts 10, 38, Peter tells us that Christ went about doing good. It is evident then that if we are Christ's servants, if we follow Christ, we must also go about doing good works. 
we are not to wait for the opportunities for doing good to come to us, but we must go about doing good. Seeking opportunities to do good, to help the needy, to bless and comfort the sorrowing, to uplift the fallen, we must search them out, not wait for them to hand us and uh, hand us up and move us to action by their appeals. Kellogg goes on to say, we are not to be narrow in our charities. For Paul says to us in Galatians 6.10, let us do good unto all men. It is true, he adds, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. But this does not excuse us from doing good work, good to those who are not of the household of faith. For he says, all men. And certainly we cannot hide behind this apology, for we have not been good even to those belonging to the household. Now, these were pricking words when Kellogg was speaking them. You can hear me speaking about them, but they, they don't prick you. But this is the third angel's message, and he is demonstrating about the revelation of the message, while Alondo Trevor Jones is um, uh, really focusing on the proclamation. And Kellogg is telling him it cannot be. We shall soon find out. For years and years, we have been well able to furnish a home for the aged, the infirm, the homeless, for poor widows, worn out ministers, aged pilgrims, and helpless children, members of our denomination, all pioneers in the course who gave liberally of their property in the early days when the work was just beginning, and whose faith in the truths which we profess has led them to put all their earnings into the course instead of holding up a competency for themselves. All these worthy and deserving ones who appeal to us on fraternal as well as humanitarian grounds, we have neglected in a manner which has become a denominational disgrace. We have seen the widowed mother with her fatherless children working far beyond her strength in order to keep her little ones with her and prevent them from suffering for food and clothing. Many a mother has thus died from over exertion. A mother who has the true instincts of self-respect will not go from door to door begging. She will suffer rather than complain. And because people do not complain, because they do not claim for assistance, we do not stop to think that they may be suffering. We seldom inquire after them. How little has been done by us as people for this class? Please think of that. This was said two years ago, and backtracking 1891 to two years ago, then uh, that brings us to 1888, 1889. This was said, uh, 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 this was said two years ago, how little has been done by us as a people for this class, for mothers, for widowed mothers. Have we not come far short of our duty? We are not going as much as done is done by other denominations. Now, I don't say this, the Lord says it, and he goes ahead. We have set ourselves up on a high pinnacle and say we are God's special people. Our cause is the Lord's cause, and we talk about ourselves as being the peculiar people, and yet we are not doing as much Christian work and Christian work of every important character as other denominations are doing. Again, it is right that more should be expected of us than others. So, Kellogg is saying we have to do a Christian work, but it should not be a Christian work as other denominations. We are not going to do the work of Isaiah. 58 as other denominations are doing we will do it as part of the third angel's message to bring about the loud cry so i just continue to quote him he goes ahead and say the bible teaches us the same thing that we ought to be doing more than others but we are doing less now look at this statement now the, he, here is where the 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 the, the the shoes meets uh, the uh, the rubber meets the road. Look at what Kellogg says. Trevor Alonzo Jones is saying the loud cry has begun, but look at what Kellogg is saying. Now, can we expect the loud cry to begin while we are so neglectful of the needy around us? We may imagine that the Lord is going to work miracles for us and do this work for himself, but he will not. We need not to expect that the loud cry will begin until we do what the Lord wants us to do. Now, 
I understand everyone on this wall understands that Trevor along the journeys was preaching about Revelation 18, that the loud cry had begun. But now to meet the challenge from Kelo saying that the loud cry has not begun really did not go well with somebody who was in the congregation. And I want you to see how the people reacted. A voice was heard in the congregation, and we know how we have conflicts uh, amongst us, and you see people raising their hands and talking about this and that. So when Kellogg said he does not think that the loud cry has begun, and it will never begin until we do the work of Isaiah 58, somebody in the crowd said, voice, the loud cry has already begun. Dr. Kellogg answered, we ought to be able to show that we are doing what the Lord says we should, should be done first. And this is what I'm laboring to say. In Revelation chapter 18, there is the revelation of the message which brings the glory of God upon the whole earth. And the, then we go into the proclamation of the message. First of all, there is the revelation. And that is what Kellogg is saying. If we have to say, the loud cry has begun. We have to show for it. He is not satisfied with Alonso saying that the loud cry is going on. The loud cry cannot go on. The proclamation of the message cannot go on until the revelation of the message does its work. You cannot bring the left hand to start working if the right hand has not propelled the whole body to start working. And this is the argument of um, Dr. Kellogg. And so he says, we ought to be able to show that we are doing what the Lord says should be done. The voice repeated, it has begun. Dr. Kellogg uh, answered, then we shall see this work that the Lord tells us must be done begin right away. I think it is interesting to note these things. Kellogg's conclusion. Now, the question is, whether Seventh-day Adventists are do, going to lead in this work or is it going to be left for someone else to do? The Lord has given us here a very precious work to do. It is not the whole of the third angel's message, but it is a part of it. You read in Isaiah 58, how can we make our light shine? If thou draw out thy soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, then shall thy light rise in obscurity and thy darkness be as the noon day. If we want the loud cry to begin, brethren, that is the place where it is going to begin. The loud cry is going to begin with our doing the things that the Lord in this chapter says come before the loud cry. So he says, we must draw out our soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul. He says, if we will do this, our light shall shine. Somebody in the congregation just following the Kelo con conversation raised a question. Don't you think the loud cry has come in? This is what the Alonzo Trevor Jones was saying. The loud cry has begun, but Kelo is challenging his position. And somebody in the congregation is also really concerned about this. Question, don't you think the loud cry has come in? Answer, I don't know. Because he is telling them it cannot begin until we reveal the message. But somebody is insisting that it has begun. So when he asks again, don't you think it has commenced? The only thing Kelo can answer now, right now, because the person is like not listening, is I don't know. Sometimes it can seem very rude, but that is the reality of the matter. I am presenting this subject of medical missionary work from my standpoint. There is everything to indicate that the Lord is anxious to have the loud cry begin to sound. But he says these things referred to in Isaiah 58 must first be done. And so far, the things that have been done in this direction have been done by other people, not by us. So, Brother Jonas may be right in thinking that the time has come for the loud cry to begin. But if the loud cry has been begun by our people, it must be because we have just begun to do a little in the way of letting our light shine. But we have done so little in that way that it seems to me that before the loud cry will make any great noise in the world, we will have to let our light shine a great deal brighter than we have ever yet done because the works comes first. 
the light must shine through these good works before we can be called the repairers of the breach and the restorers of paths to dwell in, for that promise comes after all these conditions you see. We had a testimony over 30 years ago saying that we as a people were to rise higher and higher, but it does not appear from testimonies received at different times since that one was given, that we have risen perceptibly from that time until now, a period of over 30 years. How is that cloud cry going to be given through us when a large part of the denomination are 30 years behind time and sounding are not altogether out of tune? So for Trevor Alondo Jones to say that the loud cry has begun, he was sounding what? He was sounding the trumpet altogether out of the tune. That is the conclusion of Kelo. We must do the work which the Lord has told us to do and which we have left undone. We must do our duty in relation to health principles and benevolence in connection with other questions. We must heed the light and accept the whole truth before we can expect the Lord to sound the loud cry through us. And He, he concludes by saying, the time of test is just upon us. For the loud cry of the third angels already began in the revelation of the righteousness of Christ. Now, this is the crux of the matter. This is a statement by E.G. White. Uh, Kellogg has said that uh, if the loud cry has been begun by our people, it must be because we have just begun to do a little in the way of letting our light shine. Sister White understood the issue and then wrote, the time of test is just before upon us. For the loud cry of the third angel has already begun in the word. Revelation, not proclamation of the righteousness of Christ, the seed pardoning redeemer. This is the beginning of the light of the angel whose glory shall fill the whole earth. And so the crux of the matter in Revelation chapter 18, it starts with the revelation. And they had just started a little work that corresponds with the message of Revelation chapter 18. And so we are told that this revelation is the one that shall fill the whole earth with the glory of God. In medical ministry, page 317, we are told we shall see the medical missionary work broadening and deepening at every point of its progress until the whole earth is covered as the waters covers the sea. This is Revelation chapter 18 the glory of the Lord shall cover the whole earth. And so what is the subject matter? When the midnight cry returns and it moves into a loud cry. The wise virgins should be working on having that extra oil, which is having the institutions that the Lord said they are the catalyst in revealing the glory of Revelation chapter 18. Without those institutions, we can sit here and have a session and debate about when the loud cry will begin, if it has begun or when it will begin, it will never be an unending session. But then when we go back to the blueprint which the, the Lord has marked out in Revelation chapter 18 and Isaiah 58, and then the book of Matthew chapter 25, we shall see that the glory cannot fill the earth without the talents that have been given for the seventh day Adventists are in place and working for the salvation of souls, then the proclamation can follow that. And so just to bring this to an end, I go back to, there's a lot of history to, go, to come, but it was as if we are just doing a, 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 a scratching on the surface of the whole thing. I, I'll just in ending go back to Matthew chapter 25. Uh, Matthew chapter 25. I want us to see something as we close this. I know we have a lot of things to cover, but uh, God give us time that uh, we may learn how to transmit and be able to study his word. You, you understand something, brethren, that um, when uh, the disciples were waiting for the early rain, they were up gathered in the upper room having an experience they were studying the prophecies and the events that were connected to the early rain. From that room, 
after they had an upper room experience, you find that they went about doing good. And then before that, Stephen is stoned, but he is narrating the prophecies of the Old Testament, which means that they were studying things connected to the early reign. Before we can sound the loud cry, and before we can have the latter rain, we must have an upper room experience and gather about, remove our differences, put our talents in use, be able to study the prophecies that are connected to the latter rain and the loud cry, and be able to execute the things that we find are true, and then the latter rain will start to fall. And so just uh, Matthew chapter 25, we are told in connection with the midnight cry, uh, there is the parable of the talents. Verse 14 says, For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to every man according to his um, several ability, and straight away took a journey. Now, when this parable of the talents is given, it is given in the context of uh, the parable of the uh, ten virgins. When this parable is ending, when the book of Matthew chapter 25 is ending, there is something that Christ connects with these two parables. In verse 31, he says, when the son of man shall come in his glory. This is the good man of the house now returning to check on the virgins and to check on the talents if they have been used. And then look at what it, it, it does. When the son of man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And he shall, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divided his sheep from the gods. This is the wise from the foolish. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the gods on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you <clears throat> from the foundation of the world. Now look at the things that um, these virgins who are being ushered in the kingdom had done with their talents. I won't even read it, but you understand the story. He goes ahead and tells them of the work of Isaiah 58. And then he ends the two parables that he has given in Matthew 25. Now, my challenge to all of us and uh, my question to all of us, are we going to sound the loud cry? Are we expecting to proclaim the loud cry and the fourth angel's message without revealing the message itself? If we think we can do this, then we shall be working on our own blueprint and never can man modify and better the blueprint of God. We must work on the terms of God rather than try to twist the Lord to work on our terms. If we are not going to reveal the message, then the Lord is saying that uh, he will take, and uh, I have to quote this as we end, this is UL 131, 1 1.1 and 0.2. Upward look, this is the last thing we read, and then uh, I, I can be able to pray. Upward look, page uh, 131, paragraph 1 and paragraph 2. I'm talking about revealing the message. People are really struggling to proclaim the message. You will proclaim the message, and you can be given a hundred years to proclaim the message, but it will not go as a witness, and then the end shall not come. Christ says, only the message has to go as a witness, then the end shall come, which means that it has to be accompanied by the revelation. Let us not let, let us stop this issue of trying to proclaim the message without, without revealing the message. And so this is what the Lord is going to do if we can walk in the light that he's telling us. God gives men the light, but many are filled with self-sufficient. And you remember the foolish virgins, they are stony ground, they are Laodicean, they are, uh, 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 they are increased in richness and goods, they have need, need of nothing. They are self-sufficient. They have a masterly spirit 
and they strive by carrying out their own ideas to reach a height where they will be as God. So they are trying to work on their own terms. And this is what Lucifer wanted in heaven to be like the most high God, working on his own principles and thinking that they will be successful without working with the principles of God. This is what we are working on. They place their mind first as if God must serve with them. Herein lies the danger in this. Unless God shall in some way make these men understand that he is God and that they are to serve him, human invention will be brought in that will lead away from the Bible truth, notwithstanding all the cautions that have been given. And so we can see the arguments of Kellogg. We can see the blueprint, but we say, no, we shall go and say Babylon is fallen and proclaim come out of her. But this thing to do with the revelation, we don't have money, we don't have time, and the Lord will accept our proclamation, but then he will uh, uh, wing at uh, our not revealing the message. I tell you, this is the greatest deception that has ever happened with Laodiceans. It has happened with the stony ground people, and it is happening with the foolish virgins. The Lord, Jesus will always have a chosen people <clears throat> to serve him. When the Jewish people rejected Christ, the Prince of Life, he took from them the kingdom of God and gave it unto the Gentiles. And if you think that the Sunday keepers will not do the work, then you have to read this aright. The Gentiles will do it. God will work will continue to work on this principle with every branch of his work. When a church proves unfaithful to the word of the Lord, whatsoever their position may be, however high and sacred their calling, the Lord can no longer work with them. Others are then chosen to bear important responsibilities. But if these in turn do not purify their lives from every wrong action, if they do not establish pure and holy principles in all their borders, then the Lord will grievously afflict and humble them, and unless they repent, will remove them from their place and make them a reproach. We are told what will only arouse the Laodicean is the true witness to the Laodicean. The Laodicean message is a message of hope, and it's a message of encouragement and not discouragement. So don't be discouraged. In fact, the messages are coming just at the right time, when we are seeing the agitations of the Sunday law, which is a test to Seventh-day Adventists, to be able to put their acts in order for to be ready to proclaim the mark of the beast. We are tested with the image of the beast. If we pass it, then we can be ordained to proclaim the mark of the beast. And the test, uh, which is the image of the beast, is to make us be able to show the world that the institutions that the Lord has given us as a blueprint are working and then when God sees that they are working, he can be able to take us to another step, which is the proclamation of the message. And so as a Laodicean and you as a Laodicean, we have a role to play right now and not tomorrow. We don't want to panic at the same time. We want to go on our knees and be able to tell the Lord where I have hidden my talent and procrastinated the revelation of the message and then the proclamation of it that he may forgive us so that we may be able to do the things that he's telling us to do work on his blueprint because he who has begun a good work in you will make sure that he accomplish it it is only us who are withholding ourselves when we give ourselves the lord will be able to accomplish the work he has started in us and so may the lord bless us I'd like us to pray, and then we can go into the session of maybe questions, comments, and additions, and then the Lord will bless us. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, glory and honor be unto thee. We can speak as men, but it's only thy Holy Spirit that can uh, speak to each one of us, reveal our talents, reveal our position and our duty, and empower us to be able to do the things that you are telling us to do in your word. Help us, Lord, not to rely on our own righteousness, on, on our own strength, but continue relying on Jesus Christ, who is the author and finisher of our faith. Bless your people and help this message to encourage them to do thy will. This is my prayer in Christ Jesus' name. Amen.